Lecture 24, Password Cracking and Bitcoin Mining. All right, we've got an idea about uh, how to use the GPU now. We've covered the idea of writing a kernel and choosing an appropriate workload and making that happen. And on a couple occasions, I've mentioned a password cracker uh, as something that uh, a GPU could actually do. Why? Uh, well, I mean, it depends. Are we trying to do it the brute force way? If we are, then being able to try lots of things in parallel is going to be key to making this happen. Uh, and uh, for one of the references that we're looking at is script. This is uh, an algorithm, uh, and the algorithm is intended to, well, uh, make uh, hash computation somewhat complicated, making it harder to uh, uh, calculate a uh, password uh, and therefore harder to crack. Um, this uh, is also the algorithm behind, uh, you know, a certain coin, such coin, many wow. Uh, and uh, we're, uh, well, I mean, it was pitched in 2009, so it's not exactly new. Uh, and the principles and what have you are really the same, even if compute power has increased significantly over time, so that you know, something that might have been adequate before is no longer adequate. Um, but the principles remain the same. It's just a question of how much firepower uh, one side or another has uh, available to it to bring to bear on the problem. So uh, we'll, we'll see uh, as we go along uh, what things look like right now. Um, so keep in mind um, that when we talk about uh, cracking passwords, um, then there are a couple of requirements for them to be stored properly in the first place. Uh, if you don't follow these recommendations, there's no need to crack the passwords because you know if you store users passwords in plain text um, nobody has to crack them they can just look in the database and they know them so that's not okay that's not acceptable engineering practice uh, and the inevitable security breach uh, will end with your company sending a sorry disclosure email to its clients and you will be responsible for the resultant bad publicity um, and uh, hashed and salted, we won't go into too much detail, um, but you know, hashing we're going to talk about, but salting, if you don't recall from a previous course or other experience, uh, the idea behind uh, salt is you generate some random text and you store that alongside the user's password. So when they type in their password in plain text, you add it to the uh, add, it, add the salt to what they typed in, uh, and then you combine those things and you end up with uh, the actual thing that is the input to the hash function, and you compute that. If you don't do this, if two users have the same password, they will have the same uh, hash value. So if uh, both users A and B use an insecure password, uh, they could actually see what somebody else's password is. Uh, if it happens to be the same as theirs, then that is undesirable. Uh, you solve that by having the random hash. Uh, it makes it not obvious. I mean, you could guess that the uh, user has the same password by trying to enter their password with their username, um, but you wouldn't know for sure uh, until you try it and see if it works or not. So for that reason, uh, for passwords to be stored in an acceptable fashion, they have to be both hashed and salted. Uh, if you're not doing those things, you're already not following best practices, and we have to talk about that before we talk about having the risk of somebody crack a provided password. Okay, um, so when we talk about cryptographic hashing, um, we're storing a hash of the password and the hash function that we use is a cryptographic hash function. So like MD5 is just a regular hash function. It's not cryptographic. Um, and one important reason why we want a cryptographic function is that it should be at least thought to be a one-way function. Uh, that is, given an x, we can calculate f of x, you know, and it shouldn't be too difficult to compute. Um, but turning f of x back into x, the inverse mapping must be hard to compute. The uh, notes here are more up-to-date. They, they reference the secure hashing algorithm 3, SHA-3. Uh, the uh, slides reference SHA-1. Uh, SHA-1 is a cryptographic algorithm, but it's pretty broken uh, and isn't okay to use anymore uh, as, uh, you know, there's too many good attacks against it. Uh, so some of these known cryptographic algorithms are already broken. Uh, and by broken, I mean if you choose one of those, it's like having no security at all. So SHA-1, uh, DES, uh, same thing. Uh, 
Um, that's not sufficient in terms of security because these are so broken that you know, it's easy to work out in reverse uh, what somebody's password is given the hashed value. On the other hand, uh, other systems have a perfectly fine algorithm, but a broken implementation. Uh, and keeping track of what implementations are broken is something that keeps security uh, security researchers up at night, I think, uh, because well, they uh, you know uh, the algorithm itself might be good, but the uh, implementation could be vulnerable to some attack. Uh, and even if you choose a good algorithm and the implementation has no known vulnerabilities, you also have to make sure to choose enough bits uh, in the encryption. So you want 512 and not 32. Uh, otherwise, it's you know, too easy to break. There's not uh, enough problem space and doing a brute force attack is plausible. All right. But suppose you have a good reason, you know, a non-evil reason for wanting to crack a password. Um, oh, please don't use this for evil. Um, but suppose you had a good reason. Um, well, some passwords are not secret, uh, and uh, perhaps the passwords in question has uh, already been leaked. Um, tons of uh, services have experienced uh, vulnerabilities, uh, and they're terrible about their password storage policies, and if you use the same username and password on mycrappywebsite.com and your online banking, and my crappy website database gets hacked, then the user uh, and password information are already available to the attacker without having to break anything. You can check uh, this, this website, uh, you know, checking if you have an account that's been compromised in a data breach, uh, and uh, I'm sure the uh, number has gone up a lot uh, since the time that the screenshot was taken. Um, and uh, I think Firefox even offers a service of some sort that uh, will inform you um, if a password uh, has been broken somewhere. Uh, and I know some browsers now also do a thing where if you use a password to log into a website uh, and uh, the browser knows that it has been, uh, has been in a leak, uh, it will tell you uh, such and you should change it. So, uh, yeah, pay, pay attention to those uh, notices, because they matter. They are important. Um, that is, well, the easiest way. If uh, you know, the password is already out there in the world, uh, you don't really have to do anything to crack it. You just you know, look it up in the database. Um, presumably, this is a database that you might have paid for from you know, shady hackers. Um, so may maybe that's... Uh, uh, dodgy, but you know, uh, listen, you know, you, you could if it was a matter of life or death, uh, I guess, and you know, maybe not feel as guilty about it. Okay, uh, next one. Um, the first thing is try really common passwords. Users are terrible uh, about how they construct their passwords, and um, it is usually. Uh, uh, the case that there will be at least some accounts where the password is something silly like, you know, password or system or, you know, the name of their dog. Uh, something that is very easy to guess. Uh, and you might just get a hit and then you don't have to go through the hard part of actually cracking a password or anything. You can just say, yeah, you know, look, they named their you know, dog Rover and their password is Rover. And like, whoa, I am totally surprised. How did this happen? You know, that's uh, that's a way to approach it. Um, that's more helpful if you're interested in cracking, you know, the password of one single individual. Uh, if you are, you know, an evil attacker and you are trying to get lots of passwords, so you can get lots of people's online banking. Uh, then you know that approach won't work because uh, you don't have time to find out the name of everybody's dog and or cat and or parakeet, depending on what kind of pet person they are, if they're even a pet person at all. But if you get it done. All too easy. Um, all right. Uh, if there is no known short computation for the inverse function, that is to say, given a particular hash, there's no way to get the plain text back very easily, then uh, the only option you are really left with is a brute force approach where you try all possible passwords. This could take a long time, um, but thinking about uh, doing this with the GPU would potentially make it plausible to accomplish. And you know, I don't say easy, but plausible. 
Uh, why plausible? Well, the GPU can try a lot of different combinations in parallel. The hash computation is itself just you know, a series of mathematical operations that are repeated according to a known specification, uh, and therefore it is, you know, not really... Um, it's not really unknown what you're trying to do, it's just a question of how many different uh, attempts do you have to go through uh, before you know that you've found the answer. Uh, and it could be a lot, and handing this out to the GPU, or even uh, if you want custom hardware, is one potential way to do this. Um, any website with even slightly decent design will start locking accounts if there have been too many failed login attempts. So you're not going to be very successful if you are just, you know, calling the login endpoint on the API. That won't do, uh, because you'll eventually uh, get locked out, whether your IP gets banned from the, uh, from the server or uh, whether the account that you're trying to crack gets locked. Um, either one of those could happen, uh, and then you, know, you don't get very far. No, the kind of thing that we're talking about where you really get to try a lot of repeated attempts is you've got a copy of the database, or you, you know, somehow know the hashes that you want to look at, uh, and you are now free to take as many attempts as you want. Um, you know, then, then you can try the brute force approach uh, without risk of getting locked out because you're not actually calling into the actual system. You're just trying to compare uh, your you know, desired uh, plain text uh, and uh, you know, seeing if this is the, the right one. Uh, and if it's the right one, then you use it and boom, you found the user's password, of course. So it may be comparatively difficult to find, but uh, you don't have to do all the work by hand. That's what the GPU is for. All right, so there is an arms race at work uh, to make this kind of cracking difficult. Uh, and one of the strategies to make that difficult is to force repeated iterations of hashing. Uh, and that is, you know, instead of running the hash function just one time, it is going to be a lot more. Now, the the idea of making it more difficult to compute the hash function uh, is a really important strategy in what we're doing. If you are a legitimate user and you are logging into the service, you enter your password and you know maybe you got it wrong, maybe you got it right, um, and uh, if if you get it wrong, you know there, it might take a little bit of time to tell you that you got the wrong answer, right? If if the hash function takes you know one full second to run. When you're trying to log in, if you get it wrong, uh, then it takes one full second to get the answer that says, you know, sorry, your password is incorrect, please try again. Uh, and you retype it more carefully the second time, and you send it in, and it is evaluated again. And the second time, it takes another one full second. Uh, and in the end, oh, you know, your login took you, I don't know, two seconds longer than it would have if the hash function was, you know, instant. You can live with that. You can totally you know, accept that. It's going to be you know, a slight delay, um, but since you are a legitimate user and you, you don't log in every second, so you do it just you know, once, maybe you know, lock your computer when you go to lunch and uh, come back to it again later, that kind of thing. You don't do it a lot, and it's not a big waste of your time overall. However, making it really uh, take a long time uh, is to try to make it intractable to try all possible passwords. And that's part of the goal, right? If you're making, you know, two attempts, that's no big deal. But if you have to make two trillion attempts, uh, two trillion seconds is a very long time. I mean, I'm not going to wait around that long. Are you? Okay. So even way back, um, Unix passwords forced repeated applications uh, of a hash function to increase the difficulty. Uh, and obviously, you know, the available computing power uh, that you have now is uh, much, much, much bigger than uh, was available 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, you, if you have a smartwatch, your smartwatch probably has more uh, computational power in it than early supercomputers. Uh, so it's it's not like... Uh, it's not like you have no resources uh, now, and you can also reasonably imagine that computational power in 20 years will vastly exceed what we currently have, making it plausible to crack a password that is effectively uncrackable today. That's okay. Um, just make sure you change you know, the encryption algorithm you use uh, and also the password you've been using uh, as needed to stay ahead of the you know, evil attackers who are trying to crack your password. 
right? They, uh, they may get new tools, but you get new tools as well, and as long as you are keeping ahead of it, then there's no problem, uh, and you don't have to worry that uh, your, your password will be vulnerable as long as you're staying ahead of them. You should change your passwords regularly anyway, just in case you know, there has been a leak of some sort, um, and uh, choose stronger passwords uh, in, in the beginning. Um, but uh, you, know, you, you make the best of the tools that you have. Okay, um, now, as an aside, you might have thought about quantum computing. Um, quantum computing won't wreck everything that we're talking about in here in virtually zero time. Uh, quantum computing is really good for solving problems like asymmetric key encryption, you know, like RSA encryption, because that involves factoring prime numbers, and you know, that's a hard problem, but is very amenable to quantum computing if you have a big enough quantum computer. Um, this is not as good uh, about hashing, uh, and that's the nature of the problem that we are facing today. Um, so fortunately for your banking details, you know, your username, your login, your password uh, are uh, less, of, uh, less vulnerable to quantum computing, at least as we currently understand it. Maybe somebody will come up with a uh, quantum algorithm that's really good at breaking hash functions, in which case we're going to have to think about something else uh, for, how to, uh, for how to encrypt passwords, uh, but as far as I know, uh, that's not imminently a danger. But we'll find out. I could be wrong. This might seem hilarious if you're watching this a few years from now, and it was like, everyone knows that quantum computers are great at this. What a dumb thing to say. Yeah, we'll, we'll find out. Uh, I acknowledge that uh, in the future, I could be wrong. Okay, so the main idea behind uh, script as a particular example of a cryptographic hashing algorithm uh, is to make hashing expensive in time and space. Um, and that is uh, making the number of operations that uh, it takes to brute force it take more time and take more circuitry. Um, and that increases the difficulty, making it implausible to crack for a you know, reasonable uh, time frame, right? I mean, given infinite time and infinite computers, you can crack anything, um, but nobody has infinite time. If it takes a thousand years for the attackers to crack my bank details, uh, that doesn't help them very much because uh, I will probably be dead in a thousand years and probably the bank that I bank at will cease to exist to say nothing of the fact that it's likely I'll change my password sometime between now and then but you, know, you have to make it impractical not impossible uh, of course uh, there's always this form of cracking the uh, obligatory XKCD uh, and uh, in the crypto nerds uh, imagination you know his laptop is encrypted and will build a million dollar cluster to crack it and it's no good and you know that foils their evil plan but what actually happened is you know hit him with the five dollar wrench until he tells us the password uh, which if you uh, have taken or are taking a course on computer security you've probably hit upon the idea that a lot of times humans are the weak points in the system uh, and if that's a subject that interests you you might read some books um, on the subject uh, Kevin Mitnick uh, was uh, a, uh, an early uh, I don't know, hacker, maybe isn't the right word, but you know, an, an early adventurer in uh, security uh, in computers, uh, and he frequently got access to things he shouldn't have just by uh, working the human equation, uh, and it is it is effective. Okay. Um, so if you want a formal definition of expensive in time and space, you know, it says a memory hard algorithm in a random access machine is one that uses S of N space and T of N operations, where S of N is in the you know, omega T of N, blah, blah. Fancy math words. Um, what that really means is that memory hard algorithms are expensive to implement in either hardware or software. That is to say there's no shortcuts. Um, intuitively, you know, a sequential memory hard function is one where number one, the fastest sequential algorithm is memory hard, uh, and number two, it is impossible for a parallel algorithm to asymptotically achieve lower cost. So for some of the cryptographic algorithms, they make them, you know, forcibly sequential because to do step n plus 1, you need the result from step n, which makes it very hard to parallelize that particular computation. You can, of course, you know, parallelize by trying different, uh, different inputs uh, at the same time, uh, but any uh, individual attempt 
cannot be parallelized because we have to do it uh, sequentially. Uh, and the other property that you want is that it's memory hard, which is, you know, you need a lot of memory, you need a lot of circuitry to actually do it, which means that you can't easily just, you know, throw unlimited hardware at the problem and say, yep, that's it, you know, uh, we're going to do it, uh, because the hardware is expensive and kind of makes it not worth your while. Um, so, yeah, the implementation function will look something like this, uh, and as we've just covered. Uh, and uh, to prove that such a thing could actually exist, uh, there's an example here, uh, Remix, which is a concrete example of this. Uh, and the uh, paper that introduces script concludes with uh, an example of a more realistic, that is to say cache-aware, uh, version uh, of such an algorithm uh, and a function that contains it called block mix. Uh, and it's uh, j just a way of uh, proving, if you will, that such a thing uh, does exist uh, and you could write one and it's not just made of unicorn tears and, oh you know, yeah, for sure, this totally could exist, but you know, nobody can show it. All right, so the approach that we're talking about here um, is, well, I mean, a, a little bit I don't know, brain dead is maybe the right way to put it. There's not a lot of thinking in it. It's just, you know, we try everything. Um, and uh, if we've designed it well, it's uh, very difficult to uh, brute force a uh, cryptographic hash function, right? Uh, assuming, again, the algorithm is designed well and implemented properly and there's no weird, like, side channel attack, it makes it very hard to break it. But you might be thinking, well, what if we remembered some previous work? Could that potentially save us from having to do everything over and over again. That's an interesting idea. That's an interesting idea. When we want to crack a password, maybe we don't always have to start from zero. Maybe we could remember previous computations, use those later. If we calculated the hash of the password one, two, three, four, five, uh, same one on my luggage, uh, and we knew what that looked like, um, if we encountered that hash in the future, we could jump immediately to the answer in some sort of lookup table. Uh, and that is the idea behind something called rainbow tables. There is a technical paper that describes how rainbow tables work. Um, I want to give you an explanation that requires a lot less cryptography knowledge uh, and is uh, therefore aimed at more of a general audience. Um, but it will give you an idea uh, about how you would efficiently uh, crack such a thing if you were so inclined. Part of the difficulty uh, of a rainbow table is that it's not super practical to uh, store the hashes for every possible plain text. If your password space is small, you know, users are only allowed, I don't know, six characters in their password or something, then that would make it more practical for uh, keeping all of those things in memory or, you know, at least on disk. Um, but as password length gets longer, this gets harder and harder because it would take more and more space. With that said, if you've ever encountered a website where you've tried to, you know, enter some password and, you know, you have, I don't know, your web browser pick a secure password for you and it says, oh no, I can't possibly accept this, maximum password length is 8. Surely that is frustrating because password length matters actually quite a, a lot more than uh, most other factors. You know, whether, whether you have uh, numbers and letters or symbols or anything doesn't matter nearly as much as the length of the password. Uh, which is why the uh, XKCD correct horse battery staple approach uh, is good. I've also encountered a situation where you're not allowed to enter uh, a password that has two repeating letters. So, you know, if, if you had, I don't know, a, a double L in a word, uh, that would be forbidden by these password rules, which I think is hilarious and stupid because it directly goes against the XKCD um, recommendation for correct horse battery staple because there are a ton of English words that have double letters, right? You know, this is not a particularly uncommon thing in there. You know, on the slide, you know, possible uh, appears as a word that has you know, a double S in it. And it. Oh, no, we couldn't have that as, you know, one of your 28 characters. You know, ooh, too easy to crack. So sometimes um, password rules encourage you to do the wrong thing and make it worse. Don't make a website or a service like that. I beg of you. Okay. Anyway, um, a rainbow table is necessarily a compromise between speed and space. Uh, and so what we have is a uh, cycle where we do a hash and we do a reduction. So reduction function maps a hash to a plain text. 
right? Given a plain text, we can execute the hash function uh, and we can say, all right, uh, I want to compute it. And so given this input, you know, the, the input is hello uh, and uh, it produces an output of some random jumble of strings and letters. And then you have a reduce function. And the reduce function is a mapping function. So um, in the example, if the input password is one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, and we hash it and it produces this long string of uh, hexadecimal uh, numbers and letters, uh, what we are going to do is then map it to another value. And the mapper is we're just gonna take the first six digits that we find in there. So uh, digits is in like zero to nine. Uh, so we end up with four, one, eight, nine, eight, zero. Uh, and it's this is not the inverse of a hash function. It's just a form of categorization. Um, so if we know that our set of passwords is six-digit numeric, um, then we you know, get some output, uh, we reduce it, uh, and then we uh, use that to compute another value, uh, and we have another plain text, uh, and we hash the new one and reduce it, and so on and so on, uh, which we do n times. You choose the n. So this process is repeated uh, as much as is necessary to develop these chains. Uh, and developing a chain is something that you could easily do with the GPU because you're computing the hash function and you're doing the reduction, uh, and you can do both of those relatively efficiently. Uh, and so given a particular input set and hash function, once the rainbow table is generated, you can reuse it forever. You don't have to... Um, you don't have to make them anymore. You can just download them. Uh, and um, they are not hard to find. You can look for them on the internet. And it's not like it's illegal to, to make them. It's not like it's illegal to get them. Uh, and uh, you can uh, you can get them. Uh, and, uh, you know, they are large depending on, say, you know, what length of problem you are providing and what your cryptographic hash function looks like. Um, but we're talking in the, in the range of something like 25 to 900 gigabytes. I mean, that's a lot, but it's not like an absurd amount of data that, like, nobody could possibly store that amount of data on, you know, their computer, you know, 25 gigabytes, you know, ugh. Even 900 gigabytes. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I have uh, a couple of backup drives, you know, just lying around that I use currently for backups, uh, that are easily in the you know, one two terabyte size range. So, you know, this is not the kind of storage where it's like, well, you know, it's very expensive and I can't afford it. No big deal. Um, easy to store. Um, I mean. Consider this. I mean, Fallout 76 had a day one patch of 52 gigabytes, and it was a disaster of a game. Terrible game. Don't buy it. It's awful. Uh, it's, uh, you know, pl play a better game instead, <laughs> please. I beg of you. So, I mean, the amount of data that you, know, you would have to download for such a uh, rainbow table is, is really not uh, you know, absurd. Uh, as far as we are concerned, uh, it is easily easily downloadable, uh, you know, depending on uh, how your internet is. Okay, so you've got them or you've made them. Here's how you use a rainbow table. So we start off with a particular hash. We don't know what the input uh, plain text is for it yet. We just know this is the hash. This is the password that we want to find the plain text for. Um, and so... Um, Take a look in the list of final hashes. If it's there, we're done. It just so happens that you know the hash is the you know, last step in in the chain because you computed all possible chains, and uh, you know uh, some of them will be uh, in the final version. And if that's the case, great, we're done. There's nothing else we need to do. Uh, it's right there. You just take it, uh, and you're done. Uh, if it's not there, reduce the hash that you have into another plain text, and then use the hash function on that plain text. Uh, and uh, you go back to step one. Uh, if you have a match for this, uh, then again you're done. Uh, otherwise, keep going. Uh, uh, and then um, once you've eventually done this reduce and uh, and hash function over and over again, uh, you will eventually find a case where the hash matches a final hash. Uh, it's not the same one that you started with, but that's okay. Uh, it will tell you, however, what the correct chain is. Uh, and so having identified the chain, now you're just going to evaluate all of the steps in that chain to figure out 
uh, which one is the password. So we're narrowing it down. Uh, we are trying to figure out what chain the given password that we want to crack belongs to. Once we have that, we can run through just that one chain uh, and we will do so again in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, and when we do so, we will eventually do here steps um, Step five, uh, which is really two steps in one, uh, but it is having identified the correct chain. You can start at the beginning uh, of the chain with that starting plain text. Uh, is that the correct one? No. Okay, then you know, do the uh, do the reduction uh, and try the next one, uh, and so on and so on. Just as if we were building up the chain in the first place, uh, and this really, really helps a lot uh, in terms of uh, reducing the search space, right? Narrowing it down to a particular chain of length n is going to reduce the amount of time that we have to spend cracking password possibilities. Uh, and then once we're doing that chain, uh, it is sequential, but that's okay. Uh, because, again, the maximum length of that chain is n, uh, as you have previously decided on what is the maximum length of a chain, putting a reasonable upper bound uh, on how long it will take to actually crack this password. Um, obviously, depending on the length of n and the size of the problem space, it's still a very large problem, and you know, you're not going to get an answer in two seconds most likely, uh, just because you've uh, applied a rainbow table to the problem, and the rainbow table can be really quite large. Um, but by working at it a bit smarter and using this information that we have already uh, pre-computed, or even better, someone has pre-computed for us, we can turn a problem that is basically impossible, or I should say intractable, uh, into one that we could plausibly solve you know, in uh, a fixed amount of time. Um, like generation uh, of the rainbow tables, checking them can also be done very efficiently by the GPU. Uh, and here are some numbers from uh, CryptoHaze.com using the GPU rainbow cracker. Uh, and uh, so table generation uh, f uh, on a GTX 295 GPU, uh, so not exactly the latest and greatest, but still a, an acceptable one, uh, for MD5, which admittedly is not a cryptographic hash, but is so still a hash function that people sometimes use, uh, proceeds at about 430 million links per second, uh, and cracking a password, you know, even one that seems like it complies with all of the, uh, all the random, uh, password rules, you know, it has a mixture of lowercase and uppercase letters, it has some numbers, it, it has some symbols, um, it, you know, it is not too short, um, can be cracked in under two minutes. Yikes. All right. I skipped over a fair amount of detail about how rainbow tables work uh, because there are possibilities of collisions uh, and the possibilities of loops where you know, the same plain text uh, and, uh, and hashed version appear again and again. Uh, I don't want to go into that because we're getting away from the main focus, which is number one, to talk about how GPU could actually be used in this case, uh, and number two, to see how the rainbow table strategies of working smarter, not harder, uh, and using and remembering pre-computed values uh, can really do a significant speed up uh, on the uh, problem that we are trying to solve. So uh, that's that's what that's about. Uh, and it should be clear, I think, just how devastatingly effective GPU computations are when it comes to breaking passwords. Choose secure passwords, please and thank you. Okay, uh, the world is not enough. Um, GPUs are great at this, um, but I actually want to talk about Bitcoin, uh, and this tweet uh, is how I uh, explain Bitcoin to people, um, and that's how I would explain it to my parents, I guess, if they asked. Um, at least at the time that I'm recording, I'm quite convinced it's uneconomic to mine Bitcoin. Um, it's terrible for the environment as well, um, that on top of, you know, magical internet money not necessarily being a you know, successful product, 
Uh, it's also the case that it you know uses a lot of electricity uh, and a lot of resources to uh, you know mine the Bitcoin. Uh, and in some cases, depending on how expensive or inexpensive electricity is where you live, uh, it is probably preferable to just buy Bitcoin you know on some Bitcoin exchange if you want to have some for some reason because the cost of mining it. Uh, is mostly the cost of electricity, and if the electricity is expensive, uh, it's not worth your while. Anyway, um, the other thing about Bitcoin is, you know, destroying the world. Um, this is from December 2019, but uh, I checked uh, in, uh, I don't know, maybe November uh, of 2020, and the numbers weren't that different, and the uh, country comparisons were pretty similar, so I didn't replace the screenshot. Uh, but basically, the carbon uh, footprint of the Bitcoin network is comparable to that of the entire country of Denmark. Uh, the power and electricity that goes into it is comparable to the uh, power consumption of the whole country of Austria. Uh, and uh, the electronic waste that's generated is comparable to that uh, of the entire country of Luxembourg. Uh, and so, um, yeah, uh, for most uh, up-to-date figures... Um, so uh, since I'm since I'm recording it, I'm looking at this now. Uh, the uh, carbon footprint has gone up a bit, and it's now comparable to the carbon footprint of New Zealand. The populations of New Zealand and uh, Denmark are not that different, so it's probably sort of a minor difference. Uh, and uh, now the Electrical Energy Report says it's comparable to the power consumption of Chile. Uh, and electronic waste has gone down slightly, even though the other two figures have gone up. Uh, and uh, that's comparable still to the e-waste generation of Luxembourg. Um, and that's the annualized total footprint. Uh, there's now reporting on individual uh, transactions, uh, and one of the reasons I think why Bitcoin will not replace like Visa or MasterCard or that kind of thing is that it's actually very expensive to execute a single transaction. Uh, and according to this, um, a single transaction has the uh, carbon footprint equivalent to 727,230 Visa transactions or 54,687 hours of watching YouTube. I mean, I know you like my videos a lot, and I'm sure you're real glad to be watching them, but I don't think you watched 55,000 hours of my videos. Um, the uh, actual uh, footprint of doing a transaction is something like 690.78 kilowatt hours, which is equivalent to the power consumption of an average United States household over 23.68 days. Uh, that's a lot. Uh, and it produces you know, amortized uh, 91.7 grams uh, of, uh, of electronic waste, which is about the same uh, as two golf balls. So, yeah, Bitcoin runs on an energy-intensive network, uh, and that is actually kind of a significant problem. Um, anyway, to overview with this, um, I'll give you like a, a brief history of uh, Bitcoin and, uh, you know, there's a paper uh, linked in the notes that gives you uh, more of the history, how it works and that kind of thing. But basically to mine Bitcoin, uh, mine in quotation marks, uh, it's done using hash computations, notably the secure hashing algorithm 256. Uh, and in the beginning, um, it was reasonably easy to do and difficulty increases with time. Uh, and so uh, at first you could do it with CPU, uh, but uh, CPU quickly became inefficient for this purpose. So people started using the GPU to do it. Uh, and um, well, eventually that ceases to be uh, beneficial. So uh, what do we do when GPU is exhausted? Uh, and the answer is custom hardware. Uh, and when you have custom hardware, you can design for exactly the situation that you need. The calculations needed are just the cryptographic hashing and nothing else. So you could design uh, a system that is optimized for the operations in the hash computation, which are AND, XOR, rotate, add, modulo, uh, an OR operation, and write shift. Uh, which always happen in a specific order. There's no need for a general purpose CPU or GPU that has tons of unnecessary functionality, unnecessary instructions, decoding them, any of that. You can skip all of those things because we have a very specific set of instructions that we always do and we always do them in the same order and there's nothing else to it. 
Okay. Uh, so the first hardware miners were built using FPGAs, field programmable gate arrays, um, but they were quickly replaced by ASIC miners. Uh, ASIC miners are much more efficient uh, in terms of hashes computed per second, but also power consumption. Uh, and the more of these that go online, the harder the computation is and the difficulty of mining Bitcoin in terms of time uh, increases. Uh, and these advances make it basically impossible to mine with hardware that you already have. Uh, if you want to do Bitcoin mining, you need to get the new latest and greatest hardware. Uh, and people are willing to pay a lot of money for it, so they're hard to come by. Uh, and uh, you know, ultimately, uh, it I don't think is worth it because you get involved in a really big arms race, uh, all having to do with you know everybody else is doing it and you know they have money to put into more expensive mining rigs and so on and so on. Um, so I think I've got to the. Uh, the point of this, which is to tell you why you shouldn't mine Bitcoin. If your intention is to do so in a cost-effective manner, otherwise what's the point, um, then you spend money on a mining rig, which is a significant investment, and you pay for the power consumption, which is also not zero, uh, and then there's maintenance costs uh, and what have you to um, to account for, right? You know, mining rigs need maintenance and they have to be replaced and so on and so on. Uh, and because the difficulty is high and new technology is frequently being released that mine Bitcoin more effectively or more efficiently, uh, it is quite likely that before long your mining setup costs more to run than it is earning in Bitcoin, at which point don't bother. And you, know, you could say, well, you know, I can mine Bitcoin at a loss, but I'll make it up when the value of Bitcoin increases. But you know, admit to yourself uh, now that that's basically gambling on the value of Bitcoin. Uh, you may be convinced that it's going to go up, and maybe it will, and maybe it won't. Uh, you know, the uh, history books are full of people uh, who were sure that this company, this project, this thing that they were putting all their money into was definitely going to make money. There's no way they could lose, uh, and they were wrong. And, uh, you know, that's, that's not a good outcome. You know, losing, losing your money is uh, undesirable. Uh, if, if you have so much money you don't care and you can aff uh, afford to play with it, then by all means, but, you know, pay your rent, pay your bills, so save for your retirement. Uh, and then with you know, money that's left over, sure, you could put it into Bitcoin uh, if you, for some reason, really, really want to, but I discourage you from doing it. I mean, this is not a hardware course, so obviously we're not going to talk about how to design hardware uh, as an extension uh, on the idea of um, the GPU. Uh, but it is kind of worth mentioning that uh, although the GPU is very good for certain kinds of computations and we can really make good use of it for the right kind of problem, it does eventually reach a limit. Uh, and Bitcoin is just a, a convenient example uh, of how we've reached that limit. Uh, and you know, at that point, it's more efficient to do it with hardware, uh, and uh, that is uh, a more significant investment because you have to design the hardware and get it fabricated and implemented and everything, and hardware is you know, complicated uh, in a way that we don't want to talk about in this course because it's still, uh, in the end, a software course, um, but ultimately uh, you know, we're trying to make the best use of the hardware that we have uh, and recognizing that beyond some certain point uh, there's only so much we could do on the software side and you would have to you know, make or use specialist hardware for a problem that would benefit from it.